Good evening, everyone. I'm Charlotte Ann Lucas, the Executive Director of Nowcast SA, and I want to welcome you to this mayoral candidate town hall on quality of life issues and how San Antonio can remain accessible to people of all ages. The event is sponsored by AARP in San Antonio, which has supported Nowcast SA's broadcasts on these forums since 2015. Thank you, AARP in San Antonio, for your service to our community. Nowcast SA has decided to feature two candidates tonight based on our viewpoint neutral criteria for candidate inclusion. These are rooted in principles of editorial integrity and judgment of the candidates newsworthiness and voter interest. We consider the candidates campaign activity and voter interest, which can be also measured by the percentage of votes cast for a candidate in a previous election. And so a candidate would have had to have received a minimum of 10% of the votes in a previous election for the same office or a comparable office. Out of the field of 14 candidates on the ballot, only incumbent Mayor Ron Nuremberg and his challenger Greg Brockhouse meet that test today. Here's how tonight will work. Each candidate will appear separately and give a two minute opening statement and then have one minute to respond to questions that came from you, people in the community. Ron Nuremberg will appear first, then at about 7.35, Greg Brockhouse will take the virtual stage. But first, let's hear from Barbara Aguirre, an AARP volunteer about why this is important. Barbara? Hi, I'm Barbara Aguirre, an AARP volunteer in San Antonio. There are many candidate forums this election cycle. This one focuses on something a little different, livability. Really just another way of saying quality of life, how to make the community more livable and even better for all ages. I'm sorry. Well-designed, livable communities promote health and sustain economic growth because they make for happier, healthier residents of all ages. Since then, we've spent years asking what's most important to San Antonio and listening carefully to the answers. We heard that housing, transportation, health, and employment are among the most important issues. And they don't just matter to the AARP members in San Antonio and Bear County, they matter to their families as well. These issues benefit San Antonians of all ages, from the two-year-old to the 102-year-old, from the grandmother crossing the street with a walker to the parent pushing a stroller. We also know that older adults vote. So candidates running for office this May would do well to listen to the concerns of the older voters. So they'll likely be the ones electing our next leaders. Similarly, I encourage you as voters to do your homework. Ask who really stands for you for the issues that matter to you most. That's why I'm excited to hear from the candidates today. Thanks for being here. And please remember to vote on Saturday, May 1st. Absolutely. That is what this is about. Please remember to vote. This is super important. Now, let me introduce our moderator for the evening, my fellow journalist and dear friend, Elaine Ayala. Elaine is the Metro columnist for the San Antonio Express News and has had a long newspaper career spanning 40 years, almost as long as mine. The native San Antonian has won numerous awards for her work and her leadership in the journalism industry. She's a graduate of Memorial High and the University of Pennsylvania and several journalism fellowship programs. Elaine? Good evening, everyone. It's so lovely to be here. Thank you, Nowcast and Charlotte Ann, for hosting this important event. And thank you to AARP San Antonio for making this all possible and bringing us together. Thank you for joining us. Our first candidate tonight is incumbent Mayor Ron Nirenberg. Now, now um, the mayor of the seventh largest city in the United States, Ron Nirenberg was reelected to a second term in June of 2019. Before that, he represented 
District 8 on City Council. He serves as chairman of the Sister Cities International. And prior to his public service, Nuremberg founded a small, a couple of small businesses and was general manager of KRTU FM San Antonio. He holds degrees from Trinity University and the University of Pennsylvania. Go Quakers. Um, Ron, you get two minutes for an opening and then we'll pose um, our first questions. Great, well, thank you very much, Elaine, for the introduction and to uh, the board and community of AARP. It's a great honor to be with you again this evening. Um, as I seek another uh, term uh, to serve as mayor of San Antonio, um, it has been a challenging year uh, for every community across the country, including San Antonio. Uh, but I will say that based on my conversations that I have with peers across the country on a, on a nearly daily basis, it is clear that the work that we have done together as a community um, with, with a sense of teamwork and compassion has placed San Antonio on as strong a foundation as any city in the country to come back stronger, more equitable, and more resilient from this pandemic. I'm very grateful that today, uh, as we uh, work on the vaccination process, that over half a million of our neighbors here in San Antonio have been vaccinated with at least one dose uh, of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, a full 300,000, uh, more than that actually, are uh, have now been fully vaccinated. We've been working very closely with our public health professionals to give our community the tools that they need uh, to keep themselves, their families, and their businesses safe from this virus. It has been a devastating um, uh, pandemic, however, uh, so we have, been, uh, we have been working together to ensure that we survive as a community. What I'm focused on in my third term is, number one, putting this pandemic behind us. We have to ensure that we have a healthy community first, uh, and that is protecting the physical and, and mental well-being of us all. Second, we have to ensure that we have a healthy economy and that we can have businesses come back to life and employers and employees come back to work safely, providing them the resources and equipment they need to do so. Finally, that everyone in our community, um, everyone, no matter where they are in this community, when they got here, all, how old or young they are, has an opportunity to thrive, that we have healthy opportunities uh, to get access to education and jobs here in San Antonio. And if we do all that together, as we have shown uh, throughout this crisis that we have uh, seen the very best of our community, we will truly have a healthy future in San Antonio. So as we stand today, uh, we're starting to see the, the pandemic finally subside. I wanna thank everyone who's worked together as neighbors or healthcare workers or Ten grocery store clerks remaining. or teachers uh, to come to an end of this crisis. I wanna thank you for all the work you've done together uh, there is good reason to be hopeful in San Antonio, and I look forward to earning your support for a third term as mayor. Thank you very much. We have a lovely timekeeper mayor, so you'll hear her voice when she, she wants you to wrap it up. Um, Age-friendly issues are some of the most important to AARP San Antonio and um, seniors everywhere. So let's talk a little bit about how age-friendly you see San Antonio and what programs um, new or old that you continue to promote in your next term so that San Antonio can become even more age friendly. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. And I was very um, uh, proud to continue the commitment that uh, originally Mayor Castro had signed on to in creating San Antonio or making San Antonio an age friendly city. Uh, and in doing so, we created a strategic plan uh, to focus on uh, age friendly infrastructure and services in our city to be equitably distributed. And it's founded in uh, a framework of equity that we have now made part of the budgetary process here in San Antonio. It's focusing on improving transportation access, uh, things like increasing complete streets, uh, increasing the use of public transportation, uh, and uh, ensuring that we also don't have to rely on cars everywhere we want to go. Uh, it's also about uh, ensuring that we have affordable housing, uh, equitably and sustainably affordable housing in our communities in all corners of our city, and that we increase the, the uh, amenities available to our community in terms of walkability, et cetera, as well as access to senior services, which we finally now have in every single district in San Antonio. All right, that's it. Very good. Um, 
one of the um, latest issues that access has become a center, a focal point is vaccinations. So tell me how the city is doing, how it will improve a vaccination, especially to the most vulnerable and to seniors, some of whom are having a very hard time, have had a very hard time signing up for a vaccine and really has not been user friendly in any way. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and I will be the first to tell you that uh, the severe imbalance between the demand and the supply of vaccines has been a great challenge for every city in the country. And I've been on the phone almost every day uh, over the last several weeks with the White House and with our state leaders to give us more doses of vaccines so we can make them more widely available. Despite those challenges, though, we've been setting aside a significant number of doses uh, for people who didn't have access to the Internet or who were homebound. So we were the first city in the country to have a homebound vaccination process in which uh, people who were, could not leave their homes were getting the vaccines delivered to them along with their meal distributions. In addition to that, now that we finally have more supply of vaccines coming in, we've opened up um, the process for our public health labs so that if you are over 80, um, and very soon if you're over 75, you can go to any one of the vaccination sites, WellMed, um, Alamo Dome or UHS, the Wonderland Mall, and get a vaccine without an appointment. We're clearing, uh, out, clearing the path for our seniors to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. During the, the worst of the pandemic, we saw those issues that were always on our mind, like public housing and housing in general and affordable housing and evictions for that matter. All of these issues were always there, but have become exacerbated by the pandemic. So tell me what can um, those in those seniors, those adults with so many varying income levels that feel so vulnerable to the problem of affordable housing, how much more can the city do? Highlight some of the things you're doing, but also what some of the new innovative things are that the city might um, might do. So um, thank you for that. And, and I will say that when the pandemic began, I couldn't agree more. The pandemic revealed the inequities in our community, not just in San Antonio, but across the country where we saw those food bank lines. It was a reckoning for us in the, in the how close to economic brink that millions of Americans were living in, particularly our seniors uh, and many folks on fixed incomes. What we did uh, at the start of the pandemic was uh, build our recovery and, re and relief programs on values. And the first one was no one should lose the roof over their heads, that they should be safe and they should be housed. And so we established what has become the largest emergency housing relief program in the country uh, or, or in the state and we think the country, over $133 million of mortgage uh, and rent assistance during the heights of this pandemic that is, is still being funded through the end of this year. Uh, we also, uh, before the pandemic, Hi. created uh, the first ever homestead tax exemption. And we have to work with our state lawmakers to continue to, to provide relief for legacy homeowners who have been in their homes uh, or in their apartments for a long, long time, providing tax relief for them in, in, in specific uh, that, it, that includes uh, what we already have in our senior exemptions, et cetera. Some of the um, um, people out there who are homeless are also senior citizens and they um, are especially vulnerable. Um, the city has, um, uh, has uh, done sweeps of homeless camps and, um, and tell, just tell us how, how, that, how you see that, how, um, what, what are your plans to um, help those people who have decided that the camp, a camp is, is the best option for them. Um, they have no money and um, it's hard to get into affordable housing when you're in this situation. So what can, can the city do besides sweeping them out? Yeah, and, and that is not um, the solution uh, to the challenge. And I think it starts with understanding that homelessness is not uh, the, uh, the problem in and of itself, it is a symptom of other underlying issues, including housing affordability. We have to ensure that we have an affordable uh, and sustainable supply of housing of all types, particularly those who 
uh, or, or housing that um, people, including seniors on fixed income, can afford. Uh, that's number one. The second thing is that we have to connect people with resources. Uh, we have many uh, nonprofit service providers. We have the city programs. And we also have the faith community. Uh, we have to redouble our efforts and provide resources for those service providers to do outreach into those areas that are having homeless encampments to connect people with resources. Uh, and then in addition to that, transitional housing so that folks who do accept services are not just getting uh, shelter, but they're getting shelter to help address those root causes. I, I think we have to have an, a comprehensive approach and that's how ultimately we can solve the problem. Okay. Um, we might get back to another issue there at the end if we have time. Um, and I know I'll be getting questions from Charlotte Ann from the, our audience. Um, how will you make, this is a transportation question. I know you've been very passionate about transportation issues. How will you make San Antonio a safer place for pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists? And as a frequent motorist, never a cyclist, um, there, there's danger out there. And, um, and so many of seniors, like in my part of town, are, are on foot a lot of the time to get to mm -hmm. HEB and to get to the VIA bus stop. So how can we, um, how can your policies help um, uh, bring more resources to these um, San Antonians? Well, this is a, a, we have plans, but we need to effectuate our plans. Uh, we have to build our city in a different way. For more than a generation, we've been building San Antonio into a car-centric culture. And you can see them when, when former city manager Alex Bresenio was saying that three-foot sidewalks are not enough for a couple to walk beside each other. We have to build sidewalks that are large enough for people to walk down and for uh, wheelchairs and other uh, devices to get down. And we need to separate them from the roadway so that they're not right up against fast moving traffic. The same is true about bicycles. We have a great bicycle master plan and we have to build it. And it's not just, it's not enough to simply paint a white stripe down a road and say that you've built a bike lane. So what I've advocated for is to put our money where our mouth is. We have plans and we have had a lot of talk, but we have put our resources into the place that can actually build those plans. And that's ultimately what the, the vision behind Connect SA was all about, to build a San Antonio Time. that is about more than just cars. And I look forward to making that happen. Yeah, we can have a whole issue on Connect, a whole um, period yeah. uh, on Connect SA because it's fascinating and I love the innovation in it. Um, perhaps we can talk about that another time. Um, by the way, I love that you use the word effectuate. It just doesn't get <laughs> on, the, on broadcast very much. Effectuate, it's a good word. All right, here's one on the economy. Older adults have been disproportionately affected by job loss during the COVID-19 pandemic. How will you help address unemployment? And actually in San Antonio, I think it's more underemployment of older, of older adults. You know, you see them at McDonald's. They, they work at McDonald's and they do a, yep. a really good job at McDonald's. And they're, they must continue to work because whatever they put away, whatever they're getting on social security is not enough. Well, I'm, I'm glad you, you pointed out we have a tremendous underemployment challenge here in San Antonio, and that is another uh, form in and of itself that we can talk about. But let me talk about um, how we can intervene in the pandemic created on an under an unemployment crisis. First, we have to recognize what every economist under the sun is telling us, which is that the economy has changed and some of the jobs that have been lost are not going to come back soon, if at all, uh, up to a quarter or a third of them. So what we've done in San Antonio with the benefit of voter approval uh, is that right now and, and for the next four years, we're, we've worked with Project Quest and other providers to create a training program that takes adult workers, including seniors, and brings them into training programs to, in some cases, two weeks long, get them in the jobs that are available in our community today uh, that provides them uh, a, a meaningful job with economic Ten mobility. Seconds. Uh, so we are targeting folks who have been uh, who have been affected by the pandemic, and I will tell you, in the current program that's underway right now, that's exactly who's enrolling. Time. We have over five thousand people have been through the pipeline already. That's good news. Okay, um, this is from a, a person on Facebook, Mayor. Concerning the problem we had with cold weather this past February. Mm -hmm. 
who is making sure ERCOT is working to prevent it happening again? We are only hearing about the blame and the failure. Well, this is an excellent question. And ERCOT is overseen by the Public Utility Commission, which up until I believe yesterday uh, was a horse without a head. And, and finally, that has been reappointed now uh, by the governor. But ultimately, ERCOT falls within the jurisdiction of the Public Utility Commission, whose, whose members are appointed by the governor. We are calling uh, for the state lawmakers, our legislature, and our delegation has been brilliant uh, on, for us in standing up for, in our defense. Uh, we are calling for our state uh, leaders to hold the PUC accountable uh, in, in fixing ERCOT, uh, because ultimately it's within the state's jurisdiction. Uh, and I will say that We've heard some talk. We haven't seen a whole lot of action with regard to holding ERCOT accountable and fixing the mismanagement of the grid. Uh, but we uh, are, are hopeful that our state delegation will finally be heard and some laws will be passed that will change, um, the, change the circumstances so what happened uh, on ERCOT in, in February does not happen again. This is another uh, question for, um, um, for, uh, for you from Facebook, and it also involves the freeze. Um, and it might give you a chance to continue that um, um, conversation. Sure. Seniors suffered greatly during the recent freeze. Some died. Their homes were without water or power. And, you know, it's the senior's not really asking a question. I think he's asking you to defend yourself um, and to defend city council and all its members. Um, what kind of resources um, and an emerging emergency plan will you have in place when there's another emergency? You know, climate change is showing us all too vividly that it's that it's real that we're going to expect more of it, that 100 year floods are not happening in every 100 years. Um, and for that matter, in other emergencies, we're going to have climate refugees coming to our door all over the country. So expand on what city government can do on the lowest, on the grassroots, as well as big picture. Yeah, and, and I think, um, Elaine, you, you, you hit the first most important thing is that we have to recognize that what happened in February is not going to happen every 100 years. It's going to happen more often and we have to be prepared for it. More contingency planning is required and we will hold uh, ourselves accountable to doing that. As it relates to seniors um, and housing, uh, we do know uh, that one of the gaps that we need to address is ensuring that there is a plan for communication uh, to seniors in housing, uh, particularly within our public housing community, uh, so that there is constant communication. And in the event of any kind of impending weather crisis, whether or not we, we uh, think there's going to be uh, any kind of uh, service disruption, that there are wellness checks in place and they're being conducted frequently, and that the property management companies that are, are um, managing facilities are held accountable to doing that. And there's some fail safe checks in the process. Uh, I've established a select committee to, to look over all the response at the local level, and we're gonna get recommendations and implement the things that we should be responsible for. We were talking a little bit before we went on um, to the public about the unfortunate politicization of masks and vaccines. So let's take the issue of masks for a second. Um, before we get into vaccines. I might pose that in a separate sec uh, question. Um, what, is your, what is your advice? What is your, um, your, your hope for San Antonio to, um, toward masks, toward the future, even beyond um, the time frame of the coronavirus? I, I told you that my plan is to wear masks when I travel from now on, because I would get sick at, during every vacation. And I think it was because of what was on that plane. So what, what's your feeling about masks in the future, perhaps even post COVID um, pandemic? Yeah, well, we know from the public health professionals from the very start of this, um, that 
wearing a mask, which is a layer of fabric between your nose and mouth and the rest of the world is one way that you can protect yourself. One simple way that you can protect yourself uh, and protect others from you potentially of having the virus. And so uh, it is a simple thing to do and it protects you, provides a layer of protection against COVID or any other kind of respiratory virus. And we know how prevalent they are, whether it's flu season or just plain old cold season. So I think there is some logic, um, Elaine. And if you go to other countries, you quite often see in a train or in a plane, people wearing a mask and it's simply because they don't wanna have a cold the next week after traveling. So I think the, that um, one of the experiences through this pandemic and how commonplace mask wearing has been is gonna result in people being more cognizant of how they can protect themselves during these nuisance virus seasons. In addition to when we're in the Time. middle of the pandemic, it is unfortunate it's been politicized, but there's great logic and med medical science behind mask wearing. We have a little bit more time and I'd like you to um, discuss vaccinations in the same light. Um, we've heard some really wild <laughs> conspiracy theories about vaccinations and, um, and people who remain reluctant, um, whether it's because they don't believe uh, COVID can kill them and don't quite believe that COVID is it's as serious as it is even after um, going way beyond the hot, beyond the you know um, so many predictions of deaths and, and injuries and and long term effects for those who had COVID. So tell us, um, um, talk to our audience about vaccinations and um, and their fears about what can happen to them if they get vaccinated. <clears throat> sure. Uh, well, I will say first that the vaccine uh, development and approval process in the United States is the most rigorous in the world. And that uh, there is uh, great science uh, and due diligence behind the production of uh, vaccines. And we know that vaccine technology is almost 100 years old at this point. So uh, if we want to be fully um, confident that this pandemic is, is behind us, we have to reach herd immunity. And you only do that by getting everyone sick or by getting people vaccinated. So um, we are on the cusp of seeing herd immunity in our, our, on our country over the next several months. Uh, and so I would ask people to please uh, look at the data and the science uh, the fact that over 100 million people have already been vaccinated in our community. There have been some minor side effects reported, nothing major, uh, that this is one very simple way uh, that has been uh, tried and proven to protect yourself and to ultimately save your life and the life of those around you. Uh, I'm sure uh, that, that uh, there have been experiences by people who are that are inconvenient and, and perhaps um, they don't want to take the vaccine again but I can tell you um, with with full confidence that there has been so much study and um, scientific analysis of the this vaccine above all others that you should feel confident going to get one I agree um, I don't know how much time we have left before we go to um, a video, but um, you have a, at least a minute to um, to um, to make your pitch for um, um, for your continue your continuation at um, at City Hall. Thank you, Elaine, and, and thank you to AARP for hosting uh, this uh, event tonight. Uh, I want to say um, first, uh, it has been the great honor uh, and privilege of my life to serve as your city councilman uh, for two terms and now as your mayor for two terms. I'm seeking a third term to continue the work that we have started together uh, that really is generational in impact. And uh, as we put this pandemic behind us, I look forward to uh, continued service. Uh, it would be an honor to uh, again uh, continue as your mayor and, and also to pursue the goals that we've all set together as a community in uh, La, La Vida Buena, which is our strategic plan to make San Antonio truly an age-friendly city. I'm honored to, uh, to be here tonight and uh, look forward to earning your support. Okay, I think we still have more time, correct? Correct me? Okay, so another, another um, uh, question just popped up on my chat and this is, um, uh, um, it's, 
what do you think of the efforts to cut voter access to the ballot that's going on in Austin right now? Uh, I think it's uh, wrongheaded. It's um, uh, once again a case of uh, lawmakers in Austin uh, trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. It's further politicization of our uh, electoral process. It's unnecessary and it would be a step backward uh, in, in our pursuit of a, a, a fair system of elections. Um, I hope it is not, uh, is not successful uh, because it's gonna have far reaching impacts, not just on the vote, but also on the economy of San Antonio or, or the economy of Texas as we've seen it play out in Georgia as well. Um, uh, credit to uh, the business community in, in that area for standing up for the values of democracy. I hope we do the same here before it's too late. I agree. And I hope um, that um, seniors, along with young people, come out and, um, and get more people to vote. I mean, the best way to fight these efforts is to yes. come out and vote. And whether you're a young person who's voting for the first time, congratulations, we'll make a big deal of it. Uh, Mayor, you and I voted in the last election at Our Lady of the Lake, and we were there as young people were re being cheered because they were voting for the very first time. It was very exciting. And we saw lots of seniors line up, including that 103-year-old woman from the West Side who yeah. was just lovely. And so if they can do it, all of us can do it. Okay, what are we? how are we doing in time, guys? Um, I see you're, the you're clock at... At 7.31. You, you are just about perfect. Um, we were going until 7.32, so. Well, thank, thank you, you for coming on, Mayor. I know you do a lot of these and um, I don't know how you do it. Um, count me out. You'll never have to face me uh, in a race. I'll never run for anything and I won't run against you because I don't know how y'all do it. Well, um, uh, I'll just say that San Antonio has some great coffee I've learned over the years, Lane. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, terrific. Good luck with everything. Great to see you all. San Antonio City Council from 2017 to 2019 as a representative of District 6. He served in the Air Force for nine years and works in the mortgage banking business and hosts a show called Broadcast on Facebook. He's a graduate of Texas State University and this is his second time he runs for mayor of San Antonio. Greg, welcome. Welcome. It's uh, good to be here this evening. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about San Antonio, my ideas and the future of who and what we can be. I appreciate it very much. And thank you to Nowcast and the entire team AARP. And of course, Elaine, I appreciate you uh, for moderating. And here you have two minutes for an opening statement. So here you go. Yeah, I, I you know, it's kind of a funny world. Uh, we, we've, we've changed so much over the last year, a couple years since the last time Ron and I uh, stood before you. I think it was at Palo Alto, if I remember correctly. We were at That's a, right. Everybody was sitting there, and the crowd was full. full and and Ron and I are side by side talking about the future of San Antonio, and it's just different now. We're on a camera. It's not as it's not as personal as we'd all want it to be. And unfortunately, Ron and I aren't side by side debating the facts and issues either, which is kind of gives us a chance to show you how far in depth we believe these things and where we're going to take the city if either one of us is either reelected or elected. But, um, you know, we have to make do with what we have. And I'm thankful to everybody that gives us an opportunity to at least make an argument to earn a vote. And that's uh, why I'm back in 2021. You know, we lost in 2019 in the, the closest election in mayoral history. And, and we worked hard for it. It was a tough campaign. And we learned a lot of valuable lessons. And out of that campaign, we learned that the path forward for San Antonio is all of us working together, everybody having a seat at the table. I think for far too long, our community has been divided and it hasn't had you know, parts of our city left behind for generations. And if the, if the viewers are watching this, they know those areas because they probably live in them. They haven't seen a street in 40 years. Crime's always been the same. The job loss, the lack of opportunity for our young men and women. All these areas of town have been the same for the last 40 years and they simply haven't changed. I grew up on the south side up to Valley High. 
uh, and got as far as 151, uh, but it's never been any different. That's why I got into politics in the first place was to talk about the things we can do across an entire city. And that's the ideas and things I hope I can learn from you tonight. And you can learn, uh, learn a little bit about me and my wife and I, Annalisa, uh, with our five children, just proud to be back. And our faith has brought us through that loss in 2019 to where we are today. And if we win, we win. If we lose, we lose. But at the end of the day, we're okay with it. And we're Ten just seconds. to be in San Antonio to be residents of our community and looking forward to a great future for all of us. Thank you for tonight and the opportunity to talk about that with our seniors and the rest of our community. One of the main issues that AARP and its um, members care about is um, what we call an age-friendly city. Those um, resources and infrastructure that help seniors have a better life in San Antonio. So let's talk about what you think are the best uh, city programs or where the city can do more so that, so that this age-friendly um, uh, city can become even more age-friendly. We, we really have to take a, a hard look at where the city has been over the last several years. And we, tr we do some things very good. So for instance, we opened up uh, super senior centers in every council district now across the city. In District 6, we had one right on Calabar Road, and it was, a, it was a home for people to congregate, get together, and just enjoy life, right? Whenever we talk about protecting those most vulnerable in our city, seniors are always at the top of that list. And sometimes it's as simple as a place for them to congregate, to be together, to interact, and to move around and to remember that life is outside of their home also and and we have to help and, and cultivate that and grow it but we also learn these lessons and mistakes that come from that so for instance the senior centers were consolidated but we left out neighborhoods that can't get the transportation to the senior center so i have one on Road, district six and then we turned around and people couldn't make it from old highway 90 in the west side so we have to be careful with the growth and ideas and not leave seniors behind in areas that need services very good. I'm going to um, have um, go to housing now because over the last year, you know how tough it has been for people on the edge, um, for people who um, either lost their homes or got evicted and really don't have enough public uh, affordable um, housing in the city. So what, um, what will you do if elected to ensure that affordable housing options for seniors and adults in varying uh, income levels um, can find that um, proper housing? Well, a lot of that comes from, of course, our issue with property taxes and the available resources for seniors, right? Because they're living on fixed incomes. So a property tax rate increase or change or difference in the building around them, right? We freeze their property taxes, but oftentimes gentrification and the city's growth plans, when the city comes in and builds and grows as a community, and we say, we like take the Pearl, for example, in Broadway, we've priced out generations of families that cannot afford to live in areas anymore. And oftentimes the families that get priced out are our seniors, the legacy homeowners. So when I was on the city council, we worked... Uh, for two years, Councilman Clayton Perry and I, to reduce the property tax rate. Unfortunately, Mayor Ron Nuremberg did vote against that. Um, so I would immediately go to property tax rate reductions, expanding the homestead exemption, which we fought for, Councilman Perry and I, while on the city council. Unfortunately, it didn't pass, but we got to make sure we address the gentrification issue and help seniors age in place and stay in the home that's been their generational family. So we, whoop. I'm going to get used to that voice. It's a little... <laughs> It's, it's very know, sweet. I don't um, know if people can hear it, but yeah. It, it, uh, Greg, uh, um, I, I'm going to let you speak more on, on, on housing because I know you have a lot to say. So uh, I have another question that's similar and I'll give you more time to talk about issues sure. like gentrification and um, the rising cost of housing in this city. I mean, I am amazed. Yeah. I'm amazed at what houses are are selling for in my neighborhood in the old in the oldest part of West Side. So what can the city do to respond respond to these increases? Uh, and I know you talk a lot about uh, taxes and 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 property taxes and all that. But what can make uh, what can protect senior citizens um, specifically um, 
to be able to stay in their, leg, as you call them, legacy homes or get accessible housing that's affordable in the areas that they've always known as home. So the affordability factor is really on the city. We have over-regulated. So we put so many restrictions on home builders that the cost of houses are rising. So the seniors will remember this, but years ago, decades ago, home ownership used to be the route to prosperity and wealth in our city. The number of new homes that we started building in a city really told the story of how healthy a city was. And we've gotten away from home ownership. And as a result, home ownership costs have skyrocketed. I mean, if the average home costs... $260,000, $265,000 in San Antonio, about 60 to 70% of our citizens will not be able to afford that because they don't have the income. So I think about our seniors, fixed income, right? We cannot, we have to help them age in place. And sometimes that also means we have to offer repairs and other things to their existing home because their income fluctuates. We have to be mindful of our CPS energy bills. We can't overprice our seniors with their electrical and water prices. Every dollar matters. And if they got to make a payment to their, to their, to their medical bills or for their medicines, Time. something's going to give. And oftentimes it's not their health, it's their home. Yes. Okay. Uh, now to the economy. Um, one of the things that, of course, during a pandemic, um, we suffered mightily, so many of us, um, in terms of, I'm, I'm having trouble with my computer. Hold on here. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, older adults have been disproportionately affected by job loss during the pandemic. How can you help? How can the mayor's office help? How can city government help address unemployment and more so in San Antonio underemployment of older adults who still have to work in spite of receiving just small um payments from social security and they must work like we we have to get out of this pandemic the route out of it is jobs and employment and that's why i put out a plan that talks about the mayor being me being the next jobs mayor people making more money and most importantly keeping more of the money they make our route back is path the path back is jobs and jobs now so we actually have a great opportunity look we lost a hundred plus thousand jobs due to the pandemic before the pandemic, San Antonio was already lacking in job creation, losing tens of thousands of jobs. So we have to think about what the new world is gonna look like. So my concerns are seniors don't have internet, broadband internet access, 30 plus percent of our city doesn't. The technology isn't there. So we have to start at the basic building blocks for our seniors, but here's the great thing. The new economy and the new job market is gonna ask for people to work from home or they can work from a Starbucks or a restaurant. They can be mobile and work in their own home. So seniors have a great opportunity if we do it right, get them the technology and the internet access to get them back to work plus Time. make more money than what they did before. Okay. This is a, a question that's coming from our Facebook audience. They ask, seniors suffered greatly during the recent freeze. Some died. Their homes were without water or power. As mayor, what type of resources would you implement to protect seniors? This, this is a, a hard subject, and, and we have to look at what happened in February, and we have to own it. We can't blame ERCOT. We can't blame Governor Abbott. There are problems with the electrical grid that we could not predict. Understandable. But what we failed at at City Hall was a lack of preparedness. For instance, we knew 10 days in advance. 10 plus inches of snow. We knew it was going to be in the teens of a temperature rate. And we didn't even stand up one warming shelter across the entire city until three days into the storm. We didn't know. We didn't notify our seniors, their, our residents all across the city that their water and electricity was about to be turned off. Yet we can text them to tell them to stay away from their grandparents or don't congregate during Christmas. It's a, it was a total failure. But to do it, we need to be prepared Right? We need to think about our seniors, especially those with medical conditions that may be on dialysis, may have oxygen needs, that when the electricity turned off, we put lives in danger. The San Antonio Housing Authority failed miserably. Seconds. And they failed because they were not prepared. The city doesn't own the collapse of the electrical grid. What we own is the ability to be prepared and to know in advance that we have to protect seniors Time. and children. Those are our two most vulnerable co uh, community. Um, what... Um Tell us what you think about the efforts in the Texas legislature to cut voter access to the ballot. 
You, you know, look, I don't, here's the thing about voter access. I, I don't, I like more people voting. We have to, I mean, more people engaged. I mean, I don't know how we can be opposed to that. So I, I look, I jump all over any, anybody that tries to block the route of people to get out and say, I, I want to vote. And I want to say in the future of our city or the future of our state or our country, um, increased turnout is a beautiful thing. And San Antonio suffers from a decreased turnout. I want to tell people, we elect people in San Antonio more by our apathy than our actions. So our lack of turnout affects people as well. So we should be encouraging uh, voter access. We should be jumping all over to make sure that people can sign up. Do we need basic rules in place for who can and cannot vote? Absolutely. And we can verify those things very simply. But at the end of the day, we need to encourage it. People don't... I, a lot of times elected officials will say, ah, we got a lazy bunch of voters and they don't care. Ten seconds. The truth is they don't believe in government anymore. They don't believe in city hall, that they're actually there for the people. So I think this us politicians, elected officials, we own Time. the lack of voter access and the lack of voter energy. We got to do it and get people excited again to vote. And I think we can get there and increase access. Okay. So um, I hadn't planned to ask this question, but I asked it of um, Mayor Ron Nirenberg, so I'll ask you, um, um, what do you think of mask wearing post or pandemic? And as we hope to close out this time, um, what do you think of mask wearing beyond this time, uh, especially given um, that variants are, are out there and circulating? Well, I'm, I'm not in favor of mandatory mask mandates. Um, and I think we have to, at City Hall, look, I wear my mask. And if I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna respect other members of our community, I'm gonna wear the mask. I wear it when I go into restaurants, my family does, my children do. Uh, but I don't think we can mandate that personal choice. Same thing with vaccines. We can't mandate people taking vaccines. So as we come out of the pandemic, I think we have to be respectful of the entire situation. What has happened though, over the last year and a half with COVID, is we've shut everything down and we mandated mask wearing and it turned it into a highly divisive and political challenge. And it really divided along party lines. And I think that was unfortunate, but some of that comes from the fear leadership. And, and if we're not talking about working together as the city, if the city council themselves don't work together, the mayor not working with the city council, there's this palpable feeling that it's everybody for themselves. We can't have that in our city. So look, I think we have to understand that people have seconds. right. And we have to respect that and we have to come together as a community to do the best we can. But I would not mandate mask usage any way, shape or form. And I'd open up San Antonio 100%. We got to get back to Time. living back to work. Um, you mentioned vaccinations, and I think you we want to give you more time to talk about that because there are there are a lot of um, conspiracy theories out there about um, uh, taking the vaccination. Uh, by the way, have you had your vaccine? Are you're not? Are you old? Yeah, you're old enough to get the vaccine now. <laughs> wow. So have you had? It? I'm sorry, all of us are. All of us are old enough now. Uh, well, <laughs> but have you had yours? No, I, uh, I, I. You know, it's a personal choice for me. My choice will be, I will not take a vaccine until every teacher, senior citizen, firefighter, and police officer has had a vaccine. I will not do it. I will not sign up for it. And I get it. People can say, well, you could be the mayor. You lead us all. Understood. I would lead by example, and I'd make sure at least every vulnerable person in my city as mayor received a vaccine before I ever thought about it. And I thought it was sad that council members and leaders of the community receive vaccines before those are most vulnerable. And so no, I haven't got it. I will. I don't fear the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful modern medical miracle. I think we need to take them. But if you don't want to as a citizen, that's your personal choice. I'm not for mandating vaccines, nor am I for vaccine passports or anything of the such. Uh, we Again, that's HIPAA requirements. There's medical issues there, and we have to respect that. Personal choice for families and what they want to do, I think, is huge, and we need to honor that. Okay. All right. Um, all right. I um, Unless I'm getting more questions from the audience, I'm out of questions. So I'm going to give you some time here. Greg, to, to make your plea to um, AARP members about what you would do as mayor um, to uh, make their lives um, easier. Uh, um, to And you can touch on some of the topics that we have talked about, housing and transportation in particular. You know, I think we've gotten away from at City Hall uh, a respect for the two most important uh, communities in our city, the seniors and our children. 
we've gotten away from understanding that we have to respect those who brought us to where we are, our, our seniors. They built this city and then our children who are gonna take us forward into the future. But from the senior perspective, what's most important to me is they have opportunities to live, to have a fruitful life, to have partnership, to be living in our city in any way, shape, form they see possible. That's gonna be technology, it's gonna be jobs, it's gonna be able to stay in their own home for as long as they want, right? And their income isn't affected by rising CPS energy bills. I mean, think about it. If a CPS energy bill goes up and a senior can't pay their mortgage, that's not where we wanna be as a city. So we have to help our seniors age in place and then have the transportation to get to the things they wanna do in life. And we have to be, we have to think about it. It's not just, look, we gotta build here and we gotta grow the pearl and we gotta build 151 and this city needs to be the city of the future. Understand we want the city of the future, but we gotta remember who got us here and we have to take care of them. And things as simple as the vaccine rollout, right? So the city of San Antonio tells its seniors, here comes a vaccine program. This is what I'm talking about, not thinking about seniors. We rolled out a vaccine program on 311 and an internet access. When three, a third of our citizens don't have internet access, and I don't know, my parents who are seniors took thousands of phone calls on 311, a crashed phone system. So no thought to vaccinate our most vulnerable before anybody else in our city. We actually had wealthy foreign nationals flying into San Antonio, jumping the vaccine line and getting vaccines again before our seniors. So we're out of control. We don't have a vaccine wait list. The wait list would have given hope to our seniors to know that, and I heard the mayor say, well, it's about, you know, we don't have enough vaccines. Of course we don't have enough vaccines. Nobody in the country does, but I should have a wait list of who gets it next. And we should have taken this to the community, right? So I think the attitude comes from recognizing City Hall has been built so that you, the citizen, the senior citizen, has to do everything to get to City Hall. It's not accessible. It's not easy. And we have to flip that script. So as mayor, I'm going to take the city to the senior. I'm going to show up at the Saha Senior Living Facilities. We're going to be at every senior center. We're going to bring the services to you. That's how it should work. And that includes the vaccinations, the job opportunities, the, the small business loans, whatever it is you need so that we honor what you've done for our city and to bring us to the point we're at. And I think we're failing at it. And I owned it too. I was on the city council and I could have done better myself. But we, and, and I recognize that we all have to work harder to put those opportunities in front of seniors. But no, as mayor, seniors will not be left behind. And we're gonna understand that we're gonna take care of them in whatever way, shape, form that they want their life. And I think that's huge. We have to flip the script. We gotta get City Hall out into the public, into the streets and into the neighborhoods because neighborhoods have been ignored, forgotten for, and the same neighborhoods that are broke now have been broke for the last 40 years. And nobody knows that better than our seniors because they've seen it for 40, 50 years. And it's the same people telling us they're going to fix it. Um, so I'm just bringing a different idea and a different vision. And like I said, if I'm blessed to get the job, I'm blessed to get it. If I don't, I'm still going to be working hard for San Antonio. I'm going to show up at the senior centers and my family and I are going to continue to say, hey, we love this community and what can we do to help it? You don't have to be mayor to do great things for a city. Um, and I'm just thankful to be here and to show up and have an opportunity to say there's other ideas. I wish Ron Nuremberg would debate me and, and we can have a back and forth, but he won't. But that's okay, right? We're here. We're talking about the future. And I'm just thankful for the opportunity. Um, I, I'm told that I forgot to ask you about, uh, ask you a question that I did ask the mayor. So let me give you an opportunity to do that. Over, um, over um, the last couple of months, we have seen various sweeps of homeless camps. And, um, and the city has gone in um, under the direction of um, either Health and Human Services or other offices of the city to um, discourage um, the homeless. And among them are seniors um, uh, who, are, who are buying um, or getting um, small tents to live in because there are no other places to go. Um, explain how you view this problem and how you would approach it. Uh, homelessness is a personal faith issue for me. And as, as a Catholic, I, I just inherently believe we need to go straight to helping those of us with the least in our city. And that revolves in at the top of that list usually is homeless people. And when you talk about homeless veterans and homeless seniors, you talk about things that cut right to your heart. I mean, those things hurt. I don't believe anybody wants to be homeless. Homelessness is not a crime. Panhandling is something completely different. 
but people confuse the two. So it becomes almost like homelessness is a crime because of panhandling. We have to separate panhandling off and protect neighborhoods. We must protect neighborhoods. And that's what upsets people about the homeless issue. It's the neighborhood impact, but we have to also recognize we can do better as a city, but the city's not the expert in a lot of things they deal in. I would partner with the faith community and the nonprofit organizations. We have the resources to fund it. We just need to fund it and hold them accountable. We need to revamp Haven for Hope. We shouldn't be clearing out. The city a couple of months ago cleared out 85 people from under I-37. They had nowhere to go. These folks had nowhere to go. They literally dispersed Fine. out into the city. So we need a plan. We need to work together. We need to partner with the faith community and really focus on those addictions, mental health, domestic violence. You go right down the line of reasons why people are in that struggle, but they're not there because they want to be. And we have to recognize that and treat it with respect and dignity. I'm also reminded that I, um, I didn't ask this other question in the area of transportation. I asked you one question, but I wonder if you would address um, uh, safety issues and safety um, uh, responses from the city for not just a motorist, for, but for pedestrians and cyclists. And we all know that at least on, in, in, in poor parts of time, uh, uh, poor parts of town, a lot of seniors are pedestrians. They get to HEB, they take um, uh, by foot sometimes, and or they get on a via bus to get where they need to go. Well, it's something, uh, you know, when you think about how you build a city, sometimes it's as simple as the sidewalk, um, and sometimes as simple as a bike lane. Uh, but you've got to think about that mobility from a pedestrian perspective. And there's Vision Zero programs. There's items that we put on the table to always try to minimize traffic fatalities, pedestrian fatalities. We want that to be zero, and we have to strive for a zero goal. Some people say, Greg, that's unattainable. The goal is zero deaths in a pedestrian, especially when we think about our seniors. It takes time a little bit further to cross an intersection. There has to be lighting systems that respect that. So sometimes it's as simple as the timing on the street. When I was the District 6 Councilman, I, I'll be honest, I wasn't on board with bicycle, bicycle lanes and maybe lengthening sidewalks until I went and spent some time on old Highway 90 and we redid those streets. And I recognize the plan makes sense because if people seconds. are safer, they're gonna to wanna to walk. People are a car centric community. We know that, that's San Antonio, but our seniors aren't car centric. They're traveling on those areas that we need to protect time. and make sure they have safe passage. And I think we just make the investment. It needs to be a big push from City Hall. Well, we're at the end of our time. It goes a lot faster than you think, Greg. Um, um, so uh, good luck on your campaign and um, and thanks for coming on. I know um, there will be, we're gonna go to a, a video before we close out. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Okay, we're out. All right. Uh, Charlotte Ann, are you ready? Yes. Okay, I'll bring you, you right back in as soon as this is over. Thank you, Greg. You're gonna fix my video. I am, one moment. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. All right, ready? One moment. And Charlotte Ann. All right, ready? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Elaine, for leading this conversation about issues that are deeply important to our neighbors, not just seniors like me, but people of all ages. Thank you everyone for contributing your questions and sharing your most precious resources, your time and attention. Remember, the election is May 1st. Early voting runs from April 19th to April 27th. And of course, at Nowcast, we have a map for that. It's been used by more than 185,000 people to find a place to vote. Join them by going to bit.ly, and that's bit.ly slash SA votes and vote. And thank you, AARP of San Antonio, so very much for making this possible. Good night.